Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Renfro, Director of the National Museum of the United States Navy and a retired Navy captain. Welcome to the Naval Historical Foundation's Second Saturday. In his book, The Battle of Leyte Gulf at 75, A Retrospective, Tom Cutler featured a chapter by the Naval Historical Foundation historian Dave Winkler entitled Jack and Jim, about two members of the greatest generation who received officer commissions in the US Navy and played significant roles at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Jack hailed from St. Louis, and after applying and being rejected for Army flight training because he admitted to suffering from hay fever, Jack applied for the Navy's flight training program and discovered that grass allergies didn't seem to bother the Navy. Successfully going through the Naval Aviation Pipeline, Jack eventually found himself flying Hellcats with Fighter Squadron 15, launching from the deck of the carrier Essex. During the Battle of Leyte Gulf, Dr. Winkler describes how Jack dove not once but twice on the Japanese super battleship Musashi to draw off anti-aircraft fire, thereby enabling torpedo planes to launch what would prove to be fatal blows. Jack turns out to be Jack Taylor, the founder of Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Not only did Taylor fly from Essex, he flew from Enterprise and chose to name the company to honor that fabled ship. In doing so, he would develop a friendship with a commanding officer of the successor nuclear-powered enterprise, then Captain Jim Holloway, the Jim in Dr. Winkler's story. Following Jack's successful efforts to help eliminate one super battleship that was steaming with Vice Admiral Kurita's Northern Strike Group, which would eventually threaten American landing forces off Samar the next day, two additional Japanese surface forces would attempt to break through the Surigao Strait that night and approach the landing beaches from the south. Anticipating this attack, Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf would place his veteran battleships across the egress from the Straits and place destroyers along the shorelines to conduct torpedo attacks. Jim Holloway was the gunnery officer embarked in USS Binion that night. What follows is a presentation he made over a decade ago of what subsequently happened. Following this presentation, Naval Historical Foundation Executive Director Rear Admiral Sonny Masso will return with Trent Hone and other panel commentators to discuss the presentation and offer further analysis. Since the production of this video, both Jack Taylor and Admiral Jim Holloway have passed on. We miss both of these men. It is important that we keep them in our memory along with the millions of others who served the nation during the Second World War. Shortly after 0300, the USS Benyon, a Fletcher-class destroyer, made the first visual contact with the Japanese battleship. It was 25 October 1944, and I was standing up through the hatch in the ship's main director, uh, scanning the horizon with my binoculars. The rumble of heavy gunfire had become continuous, and the lower quadrant of the southern sky reflected a steady glow from the gun, gun muzzle flashes and the PT boats had sprung their ambush and, on the Japanese column and triggered a fierce firefight. The Battle of Surigao Strait in Lady Gulf was underway. There was a tug on my trouser leg and the sailor at the pointer station next to me motioned to my eyepiece. Looking through the magnification of the director optics, the scene to the south became much clearer. The crosshairs of the lens were fixed at the base of the Jumbo Pagoda structure of a Japanese battleship superstructure. The flashes from her main turret salvos and the rapid fire of the secondary battery were lighting up the entire ship. Her bow wave showed she was making at least 25 knots. I couldn't suppress a gasp and I muttered, it looks just like the picture of a Japanese battleship. The sailor next to me said, Lieutenant, that is a Japanese battleship. The radar operator sitting behind me tersely reported that he had picked up the target and was getting reliable ranges. I reported to the captain who was out on the wing of the bridge, Captain, we are tracking a battleship and locked on with a fire control radar. The captain acknowledged and added that the PT boats were reporting that two Japanese battleships, a cruiser and at least three destroyers had just passed through the Narrows. He further added that our target was to be the second battleship. He said, let me know when you have a fire control solution on the big boy. Have the gun battery ready, but don't shoot unless specifically ordered to. We've been directed to make a torpedo attack with five fish. His voice was clear and businesslike. 
<clears throat> going back to the direct range finding optics, I could now see the two battleships in column. <clears throat> I moved the crosshairs to the second one and got a confirmation from the radar operator that the radar was locked on, and I informed the captain that we had a firing solution on the assigned target. The captain acknowledged, very well, train out the torpedo tubes and guns, but don't launch or shoot until I give the order. I switched the five-inch guns in both quintuple torpedo mounts to my control in the director, and again, standing up in the hatch, looked aft to check that the torpedo tubes were trained out on the ship's beam. The Benyon was now running in and out of rain squalls, and it was very dark. I could barely make out the other two destroyers in our three-ship division. Like Benyon, both were Fletchers. We were keeping a 300-foot interval in a loose column. The division was loitering at five knots close to the western coastline of Lady Gulf. Using land clutter to hide from the enemy radars, it gave us some cover. It was quiet in the director. Each member of the director crew was absorbed in his particular duties. Our small talk had been used up long ago. For the past seven months, the five of us, four sailors, a chief, and myself, had been together eight hours a day in this hot, cramped steel box, standing watches or at general quarters, battle stations, shooting at Japanese aircraft. We considered ourselves experienced veterans, having fought together at Saipan, Tinian, Guam, and Peliliu. I was a 22-year-old lieutenant and Benyon's gunnery officer. This was my second destroyer assignment since graduation from the Naval Academy in June of 42. After General MacArthur's landing at Lady on 20 October 1944, it was fully expected by our fleet commander that the Japanese Navy would attack Allied forces in the Lady Gulf area. There were reports from our submarines and patrol aircraft indicating that two separate Japanese task forces were headed in the direction of Lady Gulf. The hundreds of Allied transports and supply ships, amphibious craft, and support vessels all anchored off the port of Tacloban, providing support and resupply for the Army uh, forces ashore, were prime targets for the Japanese fleet. The commander of the Seventh Fleet, Rear Admiral Jesse B. Olden to Olden North, uh, expected that we would probably be involved in a night action within 24 hours, and he had six old battleships, eight cruisers, and 26 destroyers to stop the Japanese force that was expected to attack through the Surigao Strait. Benyon's squadron of nine destroyers were organized into three divisions of three ships each. Benyon's division was assigned to attack the center column of Japanese battleships and cruisers after they had emerged from the Surigao Strait area. The plan was for coordinated torpedo attacks to be conducted separately by each of the three divisions. Each division would approach in a tight three-ship column and each destroyer would successively launch a salvo of five torpedoes as it reached its pre-planned launching point. Then the destroyer would retire to the designated post-attack rendezvous area. Shortly after 0300, the soft purr of the idling fire room blowers suddenly rose to a high-pitched whine. The bridge had rung up full power. The director began to tremble and the deck plates vibrated from the propeller cavitation. As the ship accelerated, almost simultaneously, the ship's general announcing system announced, starting run in for the attack. I had been momentarily diverted, and when I again looked through the optics, I was startled to see how much larger the image of the Japanese battleship had grown. The enemy column was headed directly toward us at 25 knots and closing fast. The three destroyers in our section turned in column to a southerly course to intercept the enemy and still maintaining the 300-foot interval between ships. Standing in the open hatch of the director, I could watch the entire panorama of the two converging, converging fleets. And through the high-powered lenses of the director, the enemy ships could be seen in stark detail. As our destroyers broke out of the shadow of the shoreline, we were immediately taken under fire by the Japanese battleships and cruisers. It was strange to be rushing through the dark closing with the enemy at a relative speed of more than 50 knots, not firing our own guns, but receiving the steady gunfire of the Japanese ships. We were running through the explosions of their shots falling around us. 
The towering splashes of the incoming 14-inch and 8-inch shells were close enough to wet our weather decks. Both sides were also firing star shells, and their illumination added to the eerie aspect of the scene. As the Japanese came into range, Ohlendorf's battleships and cruisers, which were deployed in an east-west line to cross the T at the top of the Japanese column, opened up with their main batteries. All along the northern horizon, enormous billows of flame from their 16 and 14 inch main battery guns lit up the battle line. Directly over our destroyers stretched a procession of tracers as the battleship shells converged on the Japanese column. The apparent slowness of the projectiles was surprising, taking 15 to 20 seconds in their trajectory before reaching the target. They seemed to hang in the sky. Through the director optics, I could clearly see the explosions of these shells bursting on the Japanese ships, setting up cascades of flame as they ripped away topside gun mounts and erupted in fiery sheets of molten steel. They were tearing into the heavy army plate, armor plate. When the first destroyer in our division reached the prescribed launch point, the enemy's range was about 6,000 yards. When it was Benyon's turn to turn into the attack, the captain called out, Launch torpedoes, and the Japanese battleship completely filled the viewing glass of my optics. The crosshairs indicated that the torpedo aim points were stabilized on the waterline just below the foremast. Glowing dials showed the torpedo tubes were trained clear and the torpedo gyro set. I pushed the fire button on the torpedo control console and stood up to see our five fish shoot out of their tubes, and I could hear them slap the water and they were running hot and straight. Our destroyer formation had become ragged. The ships were maneuvering independently to avoid enemy gunfire. As Benyon retired to the north at 30 knots, the scene of action was one of growing confusion. The Japanese formation had disintegrated. Some of her ships were circled out of, circled out of control. Others were dead in the water. Many were on fire, and they shuddered from massive internal explosions. Still others were unrecognizable with bows gone, sterns blown away, and topsides mangled. Suddenly, surprisingly, a large warship loomed out of the darkness and confusion on our port bow. Using the joystick control, I swung the director to aim directly at this new target. I called down to the captain to report the new contact. It was at this juncture that the unidentified warship commenced firing at what appeared to be its secondary battery. This immediately established her identity as hostile because the salvos were ripple fire. This was a characteristic of the Japanese naval gunfire installations. It's in contrast to the simultaneous salvos of U.S. warships. I shouted to the captain that the ship was Japanese. No sooner had he acknowledged this intelligence than the sailor on the director range finder reported that we were locked on with fire control radar and already had a good solution for a torpedo attack. Again, I shouted this information to the captain on the bridge with the recommendation that we fire all of our five remaining torpedoes because the ship was obviously a cruiser or a battleship too lucrative a target to ignore without hesitation. And the captain repeated this instruction to fire all five of our remaining fish at this close-in target. I passed these instructions by sound-powered phone to the torpedo officer. He was manning the Mark 27 torpedo director back at the tubes, wearing the telephones himself and personally making the target data inputs and settings into the torpedoes. I told him to set the torpedoes for deep the recommended depth for setting but battleship or cruiser for battleship or cruiser target so that the torpedo would hit the vessel below its torpedo defense blisters. Again I looked aft and saw the quintuple, quintuple torpedo mount training out to port. I stood up in the hatch, reached over to the red torpedo firing buttons, and launched all five torpedoes in a salvo. Still standing up in the hatch, I could see the torpedoes come out of their tubes in quick succession with their motors running, slap the water, submerge, and head for the Japanese heavy. Now only 3,000 yards away. I felt sure we would get a hit with our spread of five torpedoes. We were too close to have missed. Benyon heeled sharply as the captain ordered left full rudder, all ahead flank. We swung to a northerly course, headed for the post-attack rendezvous point. At daylight on October 25th, 
1944, the crew on board the Benyon was tired. We'd been up more than 24 hours since 0400 the day before. At that time, we were loading 5-inch ammunition from a Liberty ship anchored off Tacloban Harbor as Navy Wildcat fighters tangled with zeros overhead. We've been at general quarters for more than 12 hours now as we listened to the reports come in over the voice radio and saw more survivors clinging to the smoking wreckage of a Japanese fleet. We sensed that a great victory had been won. A major Japanese force of battleships and cruisers had been immolated with serious damage to only one of our ships, the Fletcher Destroyer Grant. But there remained the paperwork, the chore of writing the after-action reports. These are first drafted, drafted at the battle station level, then integrated across the many echelons of command all the way up to Commander 7th Fleet, who was Admiral Rutmold Oldendorf. Somewhere in this paper trail, the fact that Benyon had made a second torpedo attack against an unidentified capital ship fell through the cracks in a process of after-action analysis. Admiral Oldendorf consequently decided that the destroyer squadron 56 torpedo attack, which was carried out as a single coordinated effort, had failed to score a hit on its assigned target. The second Japanese battleship in the column. That was because the Japanese column had reversed course 180 degrees just when the destroyer squadron 56 launched its first salvo of torpedoes. For this reason, Benyon's second salvo of five torpedoes was not included in the analysis of the destroyer squadron 56 attacks, nor was it mentioned in the most respected of the unclassified post-war accounts of the Battle of Lady Gulf, Samuel Elliott Morrison's magnum opus, History of the United States Naval Operations in World War II. It probably would have remained entirely out of the records and accounts of the Battle of Surigao Strait were it not for the independent research of a Naval Historical Foundation staff man. Nearly half a century later, Foundation researcher John Riley, by chance, encountered the post-World War II study conducted by the Naval War College of the Battle of Lady Gulf. It was by then de declassified. He sent me the copy, but ga I gave it just a routine scan and then put it on my desk where I overlooked it until 2008 when I picked it up as an unclassified source to another aspect of the Battle of Surigao Strait. And that is when I discovered a key reference to the Benyon's role in the sinking of the Yamashiro. The U.S. Navy War College report stated, and I quote, the battleship Yamashiro <clears throat> continued to close the enemy as she advanced. Shortly after being taken under fire, she began to burn. At 3.56, she turned to the west and 4.05, she was hit by a torpedo fired by the Benyon. At 0359 local time, the Benyon had fired a second salvo of second, a second salvo of intermediate speed torpedoes at what was at that time thought to be a battleship or a cruiser. And it hit the Yamashiro. At 0419, Yamashiro suddenly sank, according to a surviving Yamashiro warrant officer. And so Benyon's contribution to the victory at Surigao Strait was properly recognized and documented. Good morning and welcome to our panel discussion on the Battle of Surigao Strait, which occurred on October 25th, 1944, and is recognized as one of only two battleship versus battleship naval battles in World War II. There is never ever a better account of a specific battle or historical event than the personal reflections of someone who participated, such as we have heard from Admiral Holloway. The next best account comes from historians like our panelists, Trent Hone and Paul Stilwell, who have looked over the three-day battle of Leyte Gulf with both a 100,000 foot view, as well as a laser focus down to the shipboard level of engagement. To remind you, both Mr. Hone and Mr. Stilwell were panelists at our reflection on the Battle of Leyte Gulf at the Decatur House in Northwest Washington, D.C. in 2019, where they were joined by Captain David Michael Kennedy, call sign face, Mr. Andy Taylor, whose father, Jack Taylor, was a veteran of the battle, as well as by Tom Cutler. We're very honored to have Trent and Paul join us. Good morning, gentlemen. The good first, you, oh, good morning. Thank you. 
the first question is is really an assessment in a big picture sense. Where is Surigao Strait? And summarize, please, uh, both panelists, the sequence of events leading to this battle. And please begin by explaining the divided command between MacArthur and Nimitz. Go ahead, Trent. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Surigao Strait, uh, it is, there's a battle fought here because that is the southern approach to Lady Gulf. And as recounted in Admiral Holloway's remarks, the Allied forces had landed at Lady Gulf some number of days before. Uh, this was uh, the MacArthur's return to the Philippines. So, his Southwest Pacific Theater Command is has been advancing along New Guinea and now has the opportunity um, to leapfrog, uh, advance very quickly to to Leti, uh, cutting off a number of intermediate objectives, and this comes about because there's a realization as part of the assault on the islands around, uh, Pe um, sorry, Peleliu, um, the the Palau Islands, uh, Admiral Halsey's Third Fleet is attacking Japanese forces in the central Philippines, discovers that the apparent resistance there is much less than anticipated. He's been encouraged by Admiral Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, for ways to accelerate the progress of the offensive. So Halsey seizes the opportunity and sends a message recommending, let's cancel the current operation, you know, to seize Peleliu and some of the other objectives in the in the Palau area, let's cancel another series of intermediate operations and let's advance to Leti immediately. Uh, it receives that, and through a series of exchanges with MacArthur's command and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the decision is made that 1944 to as rapidly as possible. And so now the Allied forces are uh, going to invade Leti Gulf or Leti Island. In October 1944, Nimitz's offensive through the Central Pacific, which has come through the Gilbert Islands, the Marshall Islands, uh, and then the Marianas, is now combining with MacArthur's, which has been moving along the coast of New Guinea and then north toward the Philippines. And they unify their effort to maximize their capability to overwhelm Japanese resistance and recapture the Philippines, thus cutting off the Japanese home islands from the resources of uh, the southern area, the Netherlands, East Indies, and, and places like that. Uh, the Japanese know that this is a significant threat to their effort to continue the war. And so they have produced a series of plans, uh, victory plans or show plans, that are going to bring their army and navy forces together uh, in an effort to win a decisive battle, or at least trigger the the kind of victory that is going to force a delay or wholesale disruption of allied and, and u.s plans and so the battle of Leti gulf is the japanese initiation of this by their own plan uh, for the philippines what to do in case the allies invaded and so uh, the battle of surrogates one of the series of engagements triggered as the japanese try to execute a pincher movement to bring forces from the north and the south into Leti Gulf, destroy the Allied transportation and amphibious forces, and draw off uh, the carrier forces that are part of Admiral Halsey's third. I'm sure there's lots more that we can say about that, but that, that is a quick overview. Uh, and Paul, I'll let you add anything that you'd like to. Well, Sonny brought up the item of uh, divided command, and that was significant. Uh, MacArthur controlled the Southwest Pacific. They'd had a successful amphibious campaign in New Guinea. Uh, MacArthur and Nimitz met with President Roosevelt in Hawaii in the summer of 1944 to pick the next objective. Uh, MacArthur sought to have it the Philippines because he had made the famous declaration on being evacuated in 42, uh, I shall return. Uh, the Navy and Pacific Fleet sought uh, Formosa as a more desirable place to, uh, closer to the Japanese home islands to, from which to launch an attack. Uh, MacArthur had a great public standing at that time, despite whatever shortcomings he may have had. And so he was, Roosevelt was swayed by his arguments. 
the Japanese had a, a clever plan and, and in part it relied on knowing the psychology of Admiral Halsey. They sent a decoy force of carriers with very little in the way of aircraft on board up north to lure uh, the Task Force 58 or 38, which uh, was under Mark Mitcher, away from the Surigao or away from San Bernardino Strait, where Corita Center Force would be coming through, and to that extent was successful. Uh, Admiral Kincaid was Commander Seventh Fleet. He had control of uh, the ships mentioned uh, by Admiral uh, Holloway, and they had done a, a great job. Obviously, at Surigao Strait, they had done shore bombardment and the old battleships were well prepared for that mission. And uh, unfortunately, the center force managed to survive punishing attacks on the 24th of October in the Sibuyan Sea, turned around to regroup and then headed east through the night to go through San Bernardino Strait. And the result there was a disaster as uh, Corita's force of heavy ships fell upon light carriers, destroyers, and destroyer escorts. And meanwhile, Halsey had not left behind Task Force 34 under Admiral Lee to guard the strait, which would have been the equivalent of Oldendorf at Surigao Strait, but Halsey did not give him that chance. Now, uh, thank you for the answers, uh, gentlemen. Uh, and this may be as simple as a yes or no kind of uh, response, but uh, several members of the audience have asked uh, in context of Admiral Holloway saying that uh, some specific research by the Naval His His History and Heritage Command uh, un unraveled some new information. Is there any new knowledge or is there anything different in the historical data mining about this battle that we might have learned uh, even since uh, the last two years? Well, I'm not aware of it, but I wanted to mention John Riley, whom you pictured as having come up with that designation of the destroyer squadron, the Binion's role in attacking the battleship. I first met John Riley in 1972, when he was head of the ship's histories division of what was then called the Navy History Division, and he was a superb historian. His knowledge of warships was unparalleled. And I was on two-week active duty Naval Reserve training and was assigned uh, to the Naval History Division. And John was then looking to find photos to illustrate the volume of the Dictionary of American Naval Fighting Ships that would cover the letters for ships ending in R and S. So I had a sort of uh, sidetrack over to the National Archives to look for good photos of ships with those letters. And it was like being let loose, a kid in a candy store, uh, to see all these warship photos and to be there on official business was just uh, the cherry on top of the soda. Uh, Trent, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, there are there are a couple of things. So Admiral Holloway was referring to the the Naval War College analysis, which was uh, classified as confidential for quite some time. It's it's freely available now. I think you could find it on the Naval War College archives website. Uh, so for those interested, they can read it. It's many hundreds of pages long. It's numerous volumes, uh, but it does get into Benny's torpedo attack, uh, and it does. Uh, credit her with a hit on the Japanese battleship Yamashiro, which is one of the things that hastened there at the, uh, at the climax of the Battle of Surigao Strait. It provides a bit more detail than Admiral Holloway's remarks do, uh, but speaks to some of the confusion, which to me is one of the uh, most valuable things about Admiral Holloway's remarks. You know, he talks about uh, rain squalls. He talks about the difficulty seeing other ships that are nearby, even in company. And uh, the, the War College analysis suggests that one of the things that the Benian's Combat Information Center was tracking when she actually made that second torpedo attack was shell splashes from one of the cruisers in the battle line to the north. 
And it was a fortunate circumstance that based on the track of the enemy target, which may not have actually been an enemy target, uh, Yamashiro entered into the path of the torpedoes that she fired. So it's certainly a hit, and certainly Admiral Hollow is close enough to uh, view the Yamashiro. The ripple fire is definitely very much a signature of uh, a large Japanese ship like that. Uh, it's wonderful that he made that observation. I'm sure that's one of those memories that probably stuck with him a, a long time. And I think, Sonny, to return to your question, that's where some of this newness comes from. I can't point to anything new since uh, a couple years ago when we spoke, but uh, there are all these little details like that in action reports, in first-person accounts, and sometimes all it takes is just a, a, a little gem of insight to right, a new way of looking at something, and that will unlock some new understanding. So I'm sure there's more that we have this, particularly as we gain a better understanding of the Japanese perspective on this battle. And as a we, word, oh, go ahead, Paul, I'm sorry. Excuse me, a, a word that leaps out vividly from Admiral Holloway's account summarizes a night surface action in that era, chaos. He describes one incident after another not just knowing what's happening and you had to kind of feel your way and react as events happened. Yeah, and uh, and, and uh, kind of back to Trent and his theme that he was talking about in his uh, previous answer. Uh, obviously we have the Battle of Midway in 42, with the battles of the Coral Sea, Philippine Sea. Uh, over time, can you discuss the differences between Saragao and earlier night actions and why the Navy was so much more effective by October 44. Uh, and, 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 and it's not just uh, the execution and, and having done it before, but there's there may be some new technology, uh, more robust fire control systems, radars, things like that. Uh, and, uh, and, and then Paul, feel free to follow on to that. Uh, Trent, over to you, sir. Sure, there are some really important differences. So this is October 1944. Uh, the United States and uh, Imperial Japan have been at war for almost three years now. And there are a lot of learnings and advancements that have happened, with, specifically with night combat. Uh, uh, three things are extremely important uh, from the US Navy's context. First, the introduction of the Combat Information Center. And this comes about it, it, in November 1942. That's when Admiral Nimitz issues his first instructions to tell the ships of the Pacific Fleet to introduce a combat information center, to be an experimenting with how best to set one up. And that is a, a particular room in a ship that has a variety of different plots. And the concept was to take all the information that's available now from new technologies, radar, sonar, radio, uh, and integrate it in such a way be provided to the ship's commanding or the formation commander in a way that he could integrate it with his sense of what was going on and really take effective effect. Radar was available before combat had produced, but it was difficult to make sense of the divided and the plots uh, combined with the new plan position plays introduced with the SG surface search radar really made a tremendous difference. So. Although, you know, Paul's absolutely correct, and Mahalo's remarks reflect this, there is confusion in night actions, but the confusion in night actions by this time in 1944 on the U.S. Navy side is significantly less than it was two years before. Uh, and a clear sign of that is uh, Destroyer Squadron 24, which is one of the uh, groups to attack earlier down the strait before uh, Admiral Holloway's ship. Captain Kenmore McMahon commands that destroyer squadron, and he's commanding from his ship's combat information center. That's where he commands the ship from, because it gives him the best sense of what's going on. Another thing that's extremely important is the U.S. Navy has introduced new approaches to developing and disseminating tactical doctrine. Much of this had been done at very low levels before, so individual destroyer squadrons were responsible for producing and promulgating their own doctrine. Um, now, in June 1943, there's a new document, PAC-10, Current Tactical Orders and Doctrine for the Pacific Fleet. Uh, that is superseded in February 1944 by a U.S. fleet-level doctrine, USF-10A, which is intended 
to allow forces composed of diverse types and indoctrinated under different task force commanders to join at sea on short notice for concerted action against the enemy. And Surgao is a great example of this because it brings together two task forces. There's Admiral Oldendorf's, which is the old battleship bombardment force, which has moved through the Central Pacific. It's been part of the Central Pacific Offensive under Nimitz. And then Russell S. Berkey's uh, bombardment group has been part of the Seventh Fleet, part of Kincaid's force that has moved with MacArthur. And they combine using this new form for doctrinal instructions. They use a battle plan or at least a formation that is indicated from those instructions. And they ensure cohesion in the face of this battle very, very quickly with a, a minimum set of instructions. And finally, the last thing that's different about uh, this time compared to earlier in the war, formations are a lot more cohesive. So Admiral Holloway and Bennion are part of Destroyer Squadron 56. That Destroyer Squadron has worked together before. The captains are familiar with each other. And, and they know how to act as a unit in, in battle, and, and they do. Great. Any, any thoughts on that, Paul, too? You bet. Uh, in 1942, the situation was far more desperate than it was two years later. The Japanese had been sending the Tokyo Express down to bombard the Marines on Guadalcanal, and that was really a pivotal point in the war the uh, aircraft were able to take out some of the ships, but on the, the night of 12, 13 November of that year, a force of cruisers and destroyers prevented the bombardment, but at heavy loss uh, to the US ships, uh, the two admirals were killed, Admiral uh, Callahan, Admiral Scott, the Light cruiser, anti-aircraft cruiser Juno was torpedoed by a submarine the following day with the loss of nearly all hands, including the Sullivan brothers. Admiral Halsey had taken over from Admiral Gormley at Noumea as commander South Pacific Force. And on the night of 14, 15 November, the situation was again very dire because they wanted to head off the Tokyo Express a force including battleships, cruisers, and destroyers came. They came, or Admiral Willis Lee took his force around Savo Island, and uh, he had two battleships, Washington and South Dakota, and four destroyers ahead in column. As it turned out, the uh, destroyers were quickly pounced upon, and three of the four sank. And Lee's Washington had the benefit of uh, fire control radar. The Japanese used only optical fire control. And the Washington pummeled the Kirishima. The Japanese had lost no battleships going into that, that mid-November clash and, and lost two of them, the Hiei and the Kirishima. And Lee, in his action report afterward, credited the fire control as the big difference maker in the victory. And that victory proved to be a turning point in Guadalcanal because the Japanese sent another force layer, the uh, Battle of Tessaparanga. But by then, the Japanese knew that the game was over. Go to 1944. They had the layered defense that Trent has talked about. There were six battleships at the top of the T. That is, the ships on the top of the T could fire their batteries uh, a beam, uh, whereas the Japanese could fire only their forward turrets. Three of the ships, uh, West Virginia, California, and Tennessee, had the new Mark 8 fire control radar which was very effective and allowed them to uh, pummel the Japanese force. Five of the six battleships were survivors from Pearl Harbor that had been upgraded. The uh, only other one was the Mississippi, which had been in the Atlantic on 7 December. The Pennsylvania, which in the 30s had been the top dog, the fleet flagship for commander in chief of the combined fleet, the US fleet, 
was relegated to secondary status in this battle. She had the old Mark III fire control radar and never fired a shot. What, what a sad come down for a, a once proud battleship. And I, I have two human interest connections with that. In 1969, I served in the USS New Jersey and our skipper was Captain Ed Snyder, who'd been a green ensign on board the Pennsylvania during that operation. And one of his shipmates was Ensign John Carson, whom we know much better as Johnny Carson of The Tonight Show. And uh, occasionally I heard him talk about his affection for the old Pennsylvania during that program. Thank you very much. Uh, was there anyone in the Admiralty, to your knowledge, that, that really Ha had a solid notion that this was the beginning of the final big battle laid out by the Japanese naval doctrine. Uh, this question comes uh, from uh, viewer Steve Tilford, and uh, and you know you've uh, inspired that uh, that query. Uh, do do you think that they felt that, or or what, what's your sense uh, given what you've already described? Well, I assume he's talking about U.S. Navy admirals, and and the answer is no. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, so Admiral Halsey is trying. Uh, he's been challenged to uh, force a showdown with the Japanese fleet and win a significant victory. And he hopes to trigger it uh, by raiding uh, Japan later in the year. There, there's a plan to do a large carrier raid on Japan uh, originally in November. So it's going to come soon after Letty Gulf. That's the intention. Halsey thinks maybe he's got an opportunity to do that in earlier October uh, with a very powerful carrier raid against the island of Formosa that the Third Fleet conducts. And some of his ships are damaged in that exchange. Uh, the Japanese overestimate what they've been able to do to his carrier forces. And it looks for a moment that they're going to trigger a battle. Uh, and it, so Halsey leaves a, a crippled division. It's called the Crypt Div of two damaged cruisers. Uh, behind his forces uh, as a lure to draw the Japanese out. It doesn't work. But when the Japanese fail to trigger a, a, a large fleet action there off Formosa, Halsey gets it in his head that they're not going to fight. There's not going to be a big fight for the Philippines. And a lot of his early action in the run-up to the Battle of Lely Gulf is uh, reflective of that. You know, he has four carrier task groups. He sends two of them off to replenish and, and refuel at Ulithi, and he brings back one of them when it's clear that the Japanese are coming out. But for a long time, he's convinced that the only thing they're going to do are more Tokyo Express runs, the sort of resupply efforts that Paul was alluding to uh, that occurred in the Solomons quite frequently. And for a long time, uh, Admiral Kincaid is of a similar opinion. He thinks, well, Tokyo Express runs are probably the most likely thing that's going to happen. We need to be prepared for that. We need to be able to fight that. Uh, he realizes a little bit more quickly that the Japanese are up to something very significant uh, before Halsey does uh, and takes the necessary preparations, make sure that uh, Admiral Oldendorf is ready to fight in Surigao Strait or wherever it happens to be. Um, but it, it dawns on the, the U.S. admirals slowly uh, what, what they're in for. You know, it's interesting, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt uh, Paul's uh, perhaps thoughts on this, but uh, Admiral Thomas Kincaid, of course, Seventh Fleet Commander at the time, really under OPCON of MacArthur, uh, it's it's almost kind of a wishful thinking too, in a manner of speaking, right? Because uh, General MacArthur's uh, imperative to go back to the Philippines vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Hermo Formosa option. Uh, any any thoughts on that? Well, the, uh, the Formosa the, the, raid is, is to cut the to cut the Philippines off. Right, because they know that the Japanese can ferry planes from um, Japan through Formosa to uh, the Philippines. So one of the things that that Halsey's trying to do is isolate the the battle area. Sorry, Paul, I think I cut you off. Well, interestingly, uh, Lee and Kincaid were classmates in the uh, class of 1908 at the Naval Academy and and good friends. And Halsey had created a hypothetical or warning situation that he might leave Lee's Task Force 34 to guard San Bernardino Strait against Caritas coming through to assault the 
beachhead and the transports. Well, Halsey did not execute that plan, but Kincaid had intercepted it and assumed that Lee's ships would be there as the cork in the bottle. Halsey had been told by Admiral Nimitz that destruction of the Japanese fleet is the prime objective. And so he decided to take his entire force, the Task Force 38 North, uh, when he could have better used the assets by leaving behind Lee's Task Force 34 and Rear Admiral Bogan's carrier task group as air cover, he could have had his cake and eaten it too. As it turned out, the Japanese carriers were decoys. They were easily overtaken by the carrier planes. And as I said, the, the small boys uh, were just beaten up by the Japanese heavy ships. And Kincaid kept sending messages. We need help off uh, San Bernardino Strait. And finally, it got so desperate that uh, Kincaid sent a message in the clear. Where is Lee? Send Lee. But Lee was up north with the, um, the carriers. And then came uh, perhaps the most famous message, the naval message of World War II from Nimitz to Halsey. Where is Task Force 34? There was some radio padding. The world wonders. Should have been taken off before it got to Halsey but it infuriated him. It thought that uh, Nimitz was ragging him. So belatedly, he turned the battleships south along with Bogan's task group. And by the time they got uh, back to San Bernardino Strait, Corita had uh, flown the coop. And Kincaid later wrote in assessing the battle I can just imagine the feelings of my classmate Lee, whose ship steamed 300 miles north, 300 miles south in the greatest naval battle ever, and never fired a shot. That that's fascinating, and of course, we'll be told uh, in more uh, detail in your in your upcoming book that we all look forward to reading here in the next few weeks. Uh, one of our audience, Mr. Trent Tellink, and, and uh, I don't know him personally, but uh, I'm familiar with uh, some of his, uh, his uh, content uh, that he publishes. He asks if you would comment on uh, PT boat engagements. And of course, the most famous PT boat guys, John D. Bulkley, John F. Kennedy. But uh, in terms of uh, the engagements uh, specific to this battle with uh, Nishimura ships, and he also wonders whether the PT boats' orders to transmit their positions were giving them away to uh, Imperial Japanese Navy radar direction finding gear uh, on Japanese vessels before the PT boats released their torpedoes. So did our doctrine uh, actually uh, make our PT boats vulnerable? Is there anything you can really describe or discuss about uh, the conduct of PT boats uh, in, in this battle? The, the PT boats play a very important role, and I think they're a little bit easy to overlook, right? They're small ships, um, and it, it, the fury of, of the combat that Admiral Holloway describes, uh, the, the PT boats are out of the action by that point uh, because they've been positioned much farther south down the street to provide early warning. And many of them have orders to you know, watch for the approach of Japanese ships, hang back, report information, but not necessarily to attack. Few of them don't obey that order they choose to attack anyway uh, because you know these ships are crewed by uh, young americans who are fairly aggressive and they want to get they want to mix it up they want to get in the action uh, i think that's pretty clear from the record now uh, as to the question as to whether or not the radio was giving their position away uh yes it's absolutely true you know these boats are more akin to airplanes in some respects than they are to, to surface ships right they're they're small they move quickly they don't have the sort of radio processing facilities that a larger ship is going to have. So they're transmitting in the clear and they're trying to coordinate and communicate and send back information. Uh, they're citing reports and so on. And, and the Japanese are able to pick these up. 
you know, Japanese ships uh, among Admiral Nishimura's task force, the first one that enters uh, Surigao Strait, they know the PT boats are out there because they can hear their radio chatter. Now, as far as direction finding, the fixes that they get aren't specific enough to allow targeting. So you know a PT boat is out there. You don't know exactly where it is. You don't know how far away it is. So uh, a lot of times they're searching, using searchlights, trying to identify the position of these PT boats. Sometimes they fix them. Sometimes they shoot at them. They damage uh, several. But uh, the PT boats, many of them are able to close using rain squalls you, by going slow, by remaining relatively silent. They're able to close. They're able to make torpedo attacks. Uh, in some of the confusion, there's a friendly fire incident among Nisimura's ships, one of his... Uh, his um, battleship Fuzo hits cruiser Mogami with a secondary battery shell. It doesn't detonate, but it does do some damage. And then the PT boats also uh, hit one of the ships in the second group, the Admiral Shima's formation. They hit cruiser Abukuma and essentially knock her out of the battle and, and set her up for, for sinking later. So the PT boats play a very important role beyond just reporting the approach and the position of the Japanese forces. They, they also... Um, damage some ships and, and make it more difficult for, for the Japanese formations to remain cohesive as they move up the strait. Well, the other thing is that the Japanese were facing another enemy besides the PT boats. The enemy was geography. They were forced to head up the strait. They, they could not maneuver a great deal. Uh, don't know what they knew up ahead about what was facing them, but then it just came on in wave after wave, the PT boats, the destroyers, the cruisers, the battleships, it was almost inevitable that they were not going to be able to fulfill their mission. Uh, well, we have, a, uh, it's, it's interesting today, that. our audience, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. I just wanted to comment on what Paul was saying about, about fulfilling the mission. And I think that's, that's quite important. One of the things that I think we need to understand and uh, yeah, Tony Tolley's book on the Battle of Surigao Strait is quite good at, at dealing with the Japanese point of view. And it definitely seems from the research that he's conducted that uh, Admiral Nishimura, anyway, not so much Shima, the commander of the, the second formation, but Nishimura, the one with these two large battleships, uh, was intent on uh, essentially a suicide mission. That is, the ships that he has, the, the battleships Fuzo, Yamashiro, they're old. Uh, Yamashiro had been considered for a suicidal mission to Saipan earlier in the war to beach her there uh, in an effort to run supplies and then use her guns to support the Japanese forces defending the island. Uh, that didn't come off, but the combat value of these ships is not seen as terribly high in the Imperial Japanese Navy. And so it seems that Nishimura's intent was to penetrate the Gulf, do as much damage as possible, uh, but if he didn't make it, then he secures uh, a significant win so long as he can draw powerful forces to meet him, which he does, right? Oldendorf is there to meet him. Uh, and he was supposed to arrive off the battle area, you know, the, the Anchorage at Tacloban, some 90 minutes before Korea. So if Korea had stuck to time, it's quite possible, given what Halsey did to take the, the carrier forces and the bulk of the Third Fleet north, uh, that there wouldn't have been much facing Corita as he tried to enter uh, Liddy Gulf. But um, as Paul has recounted, uh, because of the aerial attacks that his force was subjected to, uh, Corita turned around. And so his timing didn't mesh with Nishimura's anymore. And um, Nishimura's suicide mission didn't come to a great deal. We could also argue that all three of the forces, Northern, Central, and Southern, we're all on suicide missions. Certainly Ozawa considered that going in with carriers with very little combat uh, striking power. Kurita maybe was, uh, the idea was to avenge past defeats, but to uphold Japanese honor in honoring the emperor. But after he saw what he was up against or perceived that he was up against something more powerful than actually existed, that would be Halsey's force, he decided to turn around and save the lives of the, the crewmen on board 
And we also have to consider the fact that he had had very little sleep over the past few days. And so his decision making at that point was perhaps a bit wobbly. Um, we've had, it's interesting, We've our viewers today include um, individuals from Germany, from Buenos Aires, Argentina, from um, about 16 states in, the, in our nation. And uh, a question that piggybacks on the PT boat uh, discussion uh, comes from Germany, from Jorge Simonfenig, who is a, 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 a member, a life member of our foundation. And his question is, do you think it would have been possible for the American destroyers and uh, PTs to finish off Nishimura's seven ships on their own if they'd been allowed to continue their torpedo attacks instead of having to head for safety before Oldendorf's battleships opened up? And then finally, if the answer is yes, could the Battle of Saragau Strait be read as making an early case for small is beautiful or using destroyers, not battleships? Good question. Well, if we're talking in the realm of possibility, then I could be hypothetical and we can go a long way. Uh, this is a fantastic <laughs> question. I, I really appreciate it. But uh, I think we have to recognize, right, there's there's three destroyer squadrons that, that make attacks down the strait. And Admiral Holloway's Benyon is part of the third one. So the first one, in terms of uh, the amount of destruction wrought on the Japanese force, or at least uh, Admiral Nishimura's force, is is the most significant. And that's from uh, Captain Jesse Coward's Destroyer Squadron 54. And Coward is a bit of a late addition to the battle. He volunteered his ships to Oldendorf's uh, command. He said, look, we've, we're, <laughs> we're tired of doing the sorts of things that we're doing. We want some excitement. Let us go down the strait. Let us go down the strait early. Let's do uh, what the pre-war Navy called a night searching attack. Uh, so he divides his squadron into two divisions, uh, one on either side of the strait. And between the two torpedo attacks that they mount, uh, they knock out and prov produce sufficient damage to battleship Fuso uh, that she sinks uh, sometime after the, the torpedoes that hit her. And then the other group launches a series of torpedo attacks that, that sink or knock out uh, three of Nishimura's four destroyers. So he loses roughly half of his fighting strength in the attack of one U.S. Navy destroyer squadron. So if we take that as evidence, well, perhaps the destroyers and the PT boats could have dealt with Nishimura's force on their own. However, uh, then we look at the other two attacks, right? Uh, the Captain McMahon's cat, uh, destroyer squadron 24 and then destroyer squadron 56. Uh, they're not quite as successful. Uh, McMahon's does a lot, uh, secures another hit on uh, Yamashiro, if I remember right, uh, but and opens up with gunfire confusing the Japanese formation. But you know, Yam Yamashiro continues steaming. Uh, Yamashiro takes a great deal of punishment, a credit to her crew and, and their damage control training. And um, then uh, Cal uh, the uh, Deseron 56 doesn't do a great deal either, but by that time, you know, the battleships and the cruisers have opened fire. And so the battle area is, is lit up. It has become more confused. It's not as easy to plot or plan a destroyer torpedo attack as it was uh, during Coward's run. So maybe. <laughs> uh, we, we won't know. But certainly the, the U.S. Uh, George, I hope that's a, a good yeah. answer for you. Uh, Paul, what do you have to add? Well, not much on that. Uh, Trent is more familiar with that part of it than I, but I, I think it would be useful to sketch in a little of Oldendorf's background. We've, we've mentioned his name from time to time. He graduated from the Naval Academy in 1909, progressed through a series of uh, surface ships, big and small, which many of his generation did. He and uh, Willis Lee were classmates at the Senior War College class at Newport in the late 1920s. And ironically, uh, Oldendorf's thesis was about the European situation. It turned out he fought in the Pacific. He moved on up later, he commanded the heavy cruiser Houston, took her out to the Far East to relieve Augusta as the flagship for Commander in Chief Asiatic Fleet. And uh, shortly thereafter, under Captain Rooks, the Houston was lost to the Japanese in early 42. 
Ohlendorf came back to the States and in addition to his service previously as a student at the War College, he was now an instructor. So that gave him an opportunity to be up on the latest thinking in, in terms of tactics and strategy and what have you. Then he got a cruiser division and ultimately after the victory at Surigao Strait, he was given command of all the old battleships uh, under Battleship Squadron One. Lee got the new battleships as Battleship Squadron Two, thereby splitting the command that Lee had held uh, simultaneously before with both old and new battleships. Yeah, um, we're we're uh, we're, we're kind of kind of coming close to uh, to the end of the program, and and one of the things I want to do is, uh, uh, if you're still uh, watching, uh, Mr. Tilford, uh, thank you for your question on uh, did the what did the Admiralty know, and if you uh, reach out to us via the YouTube or our website or my email at emasso at navyhistory.org. I'm pleased to send you a one of our uh, very nice Truxton bowls. So if I can get your address, we will, we're going to give you as a gift uh, one of our very handsome uh, Truxton bowls. So thank you for that. And for you viewers who ask questions, uh, we're going to choose one in the future as we go forward to uh, to do this for. Uh, uh, there's a, a couple of questions that I think uh, you know. I want to give. Uh, uh, Props out to all, all of the, the people that have asked, but uh, one question for, uh, for Paul, and this is from me. So one of the things that I was fascinated by that uh, the uh, record holder for many years, decades, for uh, Olympic medals was held by Willis Lee. And uh, I believe it was the 1920 Olympics and he won seven medals, five gold, uh, one bronze, one silver. Can you just spend a second talking about that? Well, Lee was a, a marksman from the time of his childhood in uh, Kentucky. I talked to some people who knew him when they were young and he was young, and he, he seemed to take joy in shooting at targets, both animate and inanimate, <laughs> uh, including uh, breaking a window glass in a neighbor's bedroom and the glass fell on the floor near her dollhouse. As he got higher and higher in rank, he specialized in ballistics and gunnery. Ironically, his eyesight was very poor, but as a, one of the Kentucky neighbors said, he seemed to have a built-in shooting arm. In 1907, when he was a midshipman, he won both the National Rifle Championship and the National Pistol Championship on the same day, uh, an unprecedented feat. And then in the Olympics, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning he did not win any individual medals. The seven that he received were as participants in team events, but obviously gunnery and shooting dominated his life. And there are a number of stories about going out on the fantail on board his flagship and shooting at things in the water and even out shooting the Marines, which that's their specialty. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, so one, one thing I want to, I want to make an observation to the audience, and, and it's been something that I've been uh, studying since I've been the executive director of the foundation, and I'd be interested in comments from, uh, from Trent and Paul. Uh, and, and that is the, uh, the at the time, uh, smallness of the Naval Academy. And if you think about a plebe that comes in and does four years, uh, they are exposed to seven years of, of midshipmen. So if you're a plebe, you know all the, you know, fundamentally in a very small setting, such as it was in the, in the turn of the century, uh, all those classes literally into, almost into the 30s. Uh, it's, it's, you know, b b between those athletes that are playing sports, the b brigade leadership, things of this nature, you know, you know, you have this connection, you have a, your service reputation, you have all those things, and then those co midshipmen coming behind you. And so I, I think it's fascinating uh, when we talk about, you know, relationships and how that um, is honed and how it uh, conspires to, um, to, to great productivity in combat. 
And, um, and if you look at, um, at, at, you know, you're talking about the class of, uh, of 08, for example, uh, your, your firsties would be, you know, Nimitz and, you know, Vice Admiral Tom Church and these guys, and they all actually knew each other, you know, from the time they were late in their late teens, you know, 17, 18, 19. Um, and of course, now with a much larger cohort, and I'm an ROTC guy myself, and it's not to denigrate ROTC. There's m many of the same uh, characteristics with people you serve with and what we're doing now in the joint domain. But any thoughts on on those relationships, uh, not, not related so much to Sergao Strait, but just into how uh, the cohesiveness of how people work together back in the day. Well, it was a fraternity and uh, they moved up together. They got together for social events. They got together for professional events. But the, the thing was they knew each other's capabilities and the things that they preferred. The, the great hammer that divided that came with the advent of combat in December 41. And some of those who had moved up together fell by the wayside. And so that is the great uh, divider that uh, signifies who continues to go forward and who doesn't. And, and a lot of it is luck and timing. Uh, if you talk about Admiral Kimmel or even Admiral Gormley in a, in a relationship in Guadalcanal. Uh, Trent, any thoughts on, the, on that topic? I think it's very important and it's something that can get overlooked because we have a very different context today. The Navy is significantly larger. The officer corps is larger, but it's smaller size during this time period, the early 20th century up through World War II is I think an essential ingredient for the kinds of rapid learning and innovation that I've written about. Um, that happened in to some degree because of this familiarity because you you knew strength and weaknesses as paul said so you knew if you were a superior the degree to which you could trust subordinates or what you could trust them with and i think that that is that that's very important and i think it also played a significant factor in the second world war paul's right there's a filtering that goes on right some of these Officers proved themselves to be quite capable of, uh, of combat and, and, and other ones uh, end up somewhere else. And uh, there is an emphasis on President Roosevelt's part to also give an opportunity to younger officers who might have greater stamina or, or more aggressive tendencies just because of where they happen to be in life. There's another thing that I would add to this, and that small size also contributed to a broader understanding of the capabilities of the entire Navy. So there was less channelization in terms of developing as a surface warfare officer or a, a, a submariner or, or an aviator. Officers moved back and forth between these disciplines or became very familiar with them as they reached higher command because they were challenged to do so. And you have to figure out how to integrate these different types together. Um, and now uh, as a Naval officer, very quickly, you get placed into one of these communities and and that becomes your identity it wasn't that way 100 years ago yeah and and, uh, and I, I would just like to add that you know when you when you think about what are the best attributes of uh, of, of leadership in combat and that's the establishment of trust and uh, if you agree there's three forms of trust there's the institutional you're put in charge you're a sailor would just say okay that's my captain I trust him but then there's the um, you, you move into the personal trust. Well, I know my captain's got my back. And then finally, total trust, where I'll give my life for my captain. And, uh, and we see a lot of examples like that in all, all of the battles that, uh, and particularly in the aviation ones uh, specifically. Uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to close by just asking you uh, to, to give a final thought. Uh, and, and the audience asks again, you know, what happens after Saragau Strait and is the battle of Leyte Gulf over after this battle? And uh, I'll, we'll start with Paul for the final word, and then I'll wrap the whole thing up after Paul, Trent, and then, uh, and then I'll take it home. Well, I want to bring up one more topic. We talked about this cohort of officers who knew each other well. The enlisted men formed the bulk of the crews of those ships, and the Navy was able to develop a very professional enlisted corps during the depression because outside jobs were uh, so hard to get 
So the advancement opportunities were limited. And uh, one of Lee's former shipmates said that a, a third class petty officer in the pre-war Navy was about the equivalent of a chief petty officer or a junior officer during wartime. Battle of Lake Te Gulf led on to the invasion of Lingayen Gulf and the island of Luzon in 45. Then it was a, a matter of moving closer and closer to Japan with the surface force, uh, Japanese surface force severely diminished to the point that uh, Admiral Lee who was sent back to the States for anti-kamikaze research uh, leading toward the possible invasion of Japan. And, we have to feel most grateful that the war ended without that eventuality. Thank you, Trent. Yeah, as we've alluded to, you know, Surgao Strait does not end the Battle of Ledi Gulf, right? We have the, the Battle of Cape Engano, uh, which is the fight of uh, Halsey's carrier forces uh, against the, the Japanese Northern force, their, their decoy force. Uh, and then there is the Battle of Samar, the last stand of the tin can sailors as uh, James Hornfisher called it, uh, which is, you know, full of dramatic events and, and worthy of its own uh, second Saturday, if I might suggest that. And, but Paul's quite right, you know, Letty Gulf or the invasion of Letty then leads to um, Luzon, uh, the successful campaign in the Philippines. But I think it's important to note, right? So the Japanese decisive battle, this concept that we will fight for the Philippines doesn't end with the Battle of Letty Gulf. There is a determined effort to move Japanese uh, soldiers and forces and supplies to the island of Leti, and they delay the timelines that MacArthur and Nimitz have set out, and they, they delay it through you know, determined effort on the ground, uh, resupply, Tokyo Express missions, and then also through the introduction and use of uh, kamikazes, their, their air power is relentless. And so this disrupts the Allied timetable. Nimitz is forced to delay his plans to assault Iwo Jima and then Okinawa. And you see, because the Japanese can get a good sense of where uh, the U.S. forces and their allies are going to go, uh, an increasing uh, tenacity of defense as they try to secure the ability to win a negotiated peace. Uh, they do not succeed in this. Uh, but uh, Lady Gulf marks sort of the beginning of, a, of an increasing intensity and uh, of, of Japanese resistance. And I think it's important to, to highlight that uh, because a lot of times we think that from, from this point forward, you know, from October 1944, it's largely, it's largely decided, uh, but there's an awful lot of desperate fighting left in the war. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there, there was one question and I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, start the closing process, but. What happened to Admiral Holloway uh, from uh, his service in the Benyon? He went to flight school. He fl flew in combat operations in Korea. He was the second commanding officer of the nuclear aircraft carrier Enterprise CVAN-65 in uh, some of the very first action in Vietnam. He was the commander of the United States 7th Fleet during the early part of, uh, of Vietnam operations was the vice chief of naval operations to Admiral Zumwalt, his classmate. And then finally, he was uh, the chief of naval operations. And he served as our Naval Historical Foundation president and the chairman of, of, of the uh, organization that I'm proud to be the executive director of for 28 years. So um, gentlemen, thank you for your insightful remarks on the Battle of Saragau Strait, and especially for imparting your knowledge on what is known as the last battleship to battleship surface engagement, the force multiplier of Navy shipboard radar systems and combat systems, and in conveying just how much the Navy learned in fighting at night and over the horizon that applied to the battles of the Battle of Lady Gulf. For the first time ever in our second Saturday, uh, we brought this content to you via YouTube. And before you go, you'd be doing us a great favor if you hit subscribe, like, and the bell, where you will receive all of our content notifications every time you log into YouTube. If you're not a member, please consider joining us at www.navyhistory.org. Join us next month for our 100th anniversary recognition of the USS Olympia, 
delivering the solemn remains of the first unknown soldier to the Washington Navy Yard. Learn how the remains were transported to the Capitol Rotunda to Lyon State prior to transferring via catafalque to the site of their present location in Arlington National Cemetery. We thank you for your participation today, your great questions, and always for your support of our foundation. Have a great month. Thank you.